Our panelists um, are Buffy Price, who is the AI for Good Partnerships Manager at Element AI, and she's responsible for identifying and managing long-term and project-based partnerships with nonprofits and international organizations and the public sector. Then we have Liam Beiser McGrath, who is a <clears throat> senior research fellow at the University of Constance and a research associate at ETH Zurich in the International Policy Economy Group. His research helps to understand the politics of climate change. Then we have Felix Kreuzig, who's the head of the working group Land Use Infrastructures and Transport at the Mercator Research Institute of Global Commons and Climate Change and professor at the Technical University of Berlin. He's also a co coordinating lead author of the IPCC's sixth assessment report. Our next panelist is Eniko Seke. She is a senior data scientist at the Swiss Data Science Center, and her research uses machine learning to advance our understanding of the climate and how it changes. <clears throat> then we have Christina Ore Honig, um, who is the head of the Laboratory of Urban and Urban Energy Systems at EMPA, which is the Swiss Federal Laboratory for Material Science and Technology. Her work advances the modeling of energy demand in buildings and by this helps to decarbonize the building sector. And then we have Olivier Corradi, um, who's the founder of the company Tomorrow and the creator of Electricity Map that visualizes the CO2 emissions from the power grid in real time. Um, so this um, <clears throat> panel discussion will grapple, grapple with the fact that the global economy needs to reach net zero carbon emissions within the next um, two to three decades. And this is a pretty tight timeline and only allows for um, limited experimentation and a few dead ends. Um, in this panel, we will discuss what will need to happen for creating impactful research and work that's leverage, leveraging machine learning on this timeline. And we'll start off with um, moderated questions for the first half and then open it up to the audience. So let's welcome our panelists. So um, to start off, I would like each of you to address in one sentence, one application of machine learning to climate change adaptation or mitigation or climate change science that um, you particularly like or that surprised you or that you think is missing. I had to be first, didn't I? Um, well, I'm quite new to the field, so it's all surprising to me. Um, I'm most enthusiastic about the mitigation um, piece and particularly looking into energy in um, industries, um, smart grids being one of them, charging um, electric vehicles perhaps overnight in sort of local networks and I think there's some, some interesting work to be done there. Um, so one sentence is a bit short but I'll try and be quick. Um, so I'm really interested in how we can use kind of climate information from remote sensing and integrating this with more local level directly observable social interactions in terms of political behavior and in terms of also voting and this kind of thing. Uh, very hard to say because like when you're so much uh, embedded into that, I didn't see it from the outside. Um, I, I would like to repeat my, my first point that it needs to be like embedded in part of policies. Um, of course, not really answering the question, but I think in, if you if you have a specific application and you co-design with policy and governance things, um, then it uh, develops its full, uh, full potential. Um, yeah, one sentence is short, but coming from a machine learning background and discovering a little bit the climate world uh, and working more on the climate science part, I think uh, causality and understanding the factors a little bit deeper, I, I think this can help us understand a lot of what's going on. Uh, yeah, maybe one example from the building sector, which surprised me quite a lot. Um, is actually on, on building operation where um, with just installing basically one sensor where you um, uh, monitor the room temperature, uh, a colleague of mine figured out that he could train actually a, a neural network uh, and to, together with forecasting methods use this example to uh, actually improve the operation and he could reduce the energy consumption by 25%, which is quite a lot by just simple means. And I think there's quite some potential in that area. 
So I already gave an example this morning uh, with my talk, but I'll give another one, which is in general, we can use AI to compute the footprint of everything. And that goes towards what you said, Felix, uh, on the fact that we need policy to act. So if we want to have properly quantified externality and properly price it, the suit to externality, that will require us to understand what the footprint of everything is. And this is typically something where AI can help. Um, I can elaborate later if you want. Uh, then I wanted to speak a little bit about uh, barriers. Uh, so what, what are the most important barriers, uh, in your opinion, for uh, that researchers that are, when they work at the intersection between machine learning and climate change face? Uh, for example, publishing incentives that are different between the fields. I wanted to know if you had suggestion to alleviate those, those bottlenecks. Uh, for instance, uh, and Nico was, was spoke about the, the Swiss uh, Data Science Center that uh, there was an initiative that, that direction, maybe. Um, okay, for the projects that I'm working on around Earth observation, um, the biggest challenge is um, satellite imagery. Um, we have um, some great relationships with um, Satellite Applications Catapult, and through them we can get Maxar data for um, proof of concept studies, but we can use it to train our algorithms, but we can't then give it to um, the organisations that we're working with who then have to buy the data. And then if we do want to um, roll out those algorithms at any scale, the prohibitive costs of, of purchasing that data. Um, so that's the, the biggest challenge for us. Um, so I can only really speak from my kind of disciplinary knowledge from the social sciences within university systems in the US, the UK, Germany and Switzerland which is that there's still very strong disciplinary norms in terms of where you publish. And also this is very much linked to your career incentives. So in political science, if you want to progress to a reputable level, you should be publishing in the top three political science journals. In econ, this is the top five econ journals, whereas kind of these more interdisciplinary journals that are publishing the kind of intersection of social science and climate change and natural sciences, such as nature, climate change, science, all this kind of thing, these are considered less important. So these career incentives um, within the university structure can to some extent be a hurdle and universities are slowly coming around to pushing for more interdisciplinary things, but large organizations such as this, there's a lot of institutional inertia. So this is kind of a barrier for doing this kind of research. <laughs> Um, I think it's one of the key barriers is like, like if you want to go into very interesting questions, usually you need more than one uh, method, more than one ML method, more than one also beyond ML methods. And that means you need a lot of expertise that is hardly available in like one or two persons. So like um, that means there are a lot of collaboration needed to tackle the really interesting questions. And it's, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, like it's not institutionally we discuss it's not so easy to get it easily done um, so i really liked buffy's slide with building trust i think that's very difficult to do but i would say that even beyond before that we have a first step of how do we get people together to collaborate and uh, so i'm at the swiss data science center and one of the things that the center was was built is to help people from domain science it's not just climate it's all the domains uh, and uh, so in a way to really bring people together. And I think we need a little bit more initiatives like that because that's, a, that's, and it's also really hard to get over the first step of like really understanding each other, like you said. And th that's kind of the thing where we probably would give up first. Um, and then for publishing, I think it's, it's not easy for young PhDs, let's say, who, um, they like both, but they don't know where to publish. Is it machine learning or not? So who knows, maybe in the future, if we can get joint journals somehow uh, to, to really not uh, push them away from something that they would might like to do, but it's not appreciated. Uh, one barrier, what, what we usually have, um, or we have to deal with is at the, at the urban scale that you need a lot of data usually, and that this data are usually very distributed. So if you want to get data from energy utilities, uh, you have a lot of privacy uh, protection issues. And most of the time it takes just a long time to get hand of this data. And there to find ways how we can more easily share this information without um, having problems with privacy uh, that would make our lives much easier. 
And I would absolutely second that. Uh, access to data is, is a very critical point. As soon as you have a more precise or wide, more granular data set available, you immediately have interesting research application that happens. Uh, and the second thing is as soon as you publish something in research, it's also paramount that uh, the data follows and the code follows such that you can do replicable studies. Because this is also where you can compare machine learning models one to another. Uh, so it's in the end for me, it's a lot about data. Thank you. Um, and from an uh, industry um, point of view, um, which are the struggles that startups and data science company face when they work or want to work on problems that are related to climate uh, change? So Buffy, you talked about uh, the, like, the difficulty of understanding or working on the, the questions, what's the vocabulary, and maybe elaborate more on the process. Uh, yeah, I'm really interested in, in these sort of, uh, sort of legal structures um, that can be huge barriers. Uh, my background in, in the charity sector, so charitable regulations, particularly in the UK, are really strict about uh, what you can do. They sort of can't make profit, um, and they but they do have access to certain grants and funding opportunities that aren't available to a for-profit company. So if you're doing for good projects, social benefit projects, you, you don't have access to those same funds, but you need to, so you maybe need to fund them out of your um, your uh, existing profits. If you're a startup, you, you don't have those. Uh, and that, that can be a real challenge. Um, so, so just the way structures are, uh, the legal structures are as they are, as they stand can be huge barriers between working effectively as a for-profit startup. <laughs> Or a charity. We have something in the UK. Um, there's a there's an interim. It's called CIC, a community interest company. It's it's supposed to sort of bridge that gap, but it's not very effective, and people don't know what it means, and they don't. It doesn't really ac open access to to funding and grants in the same way. So that's something needs to be addressed around that because I think the more um, people are particularly interested in social benefit, um, that they still need to pay their wages, um, uh, and we we can't overlook that that they, they need to be sustainable and not reliant on grants or, or membership money, for example, that Amnesty International is. So just unlocking those barriers is, is just a real challenge. No, the, the biggest barrier, is, uh, so as soon as you're for profit, uh, the biggest barrier is formulate a business model, to be honest. Uh, and if, if you take a step back on what we've done, we've asked ourselves a lot the question of, should we be for profit or should we be not for profit? And the reason why I personally believe that we can have a greater impact if we're for profit is that if we really wanna fix this worldwide problem, we need to attract enough capital and be able to formulate the business model that enables this thing to have much more impact than what it could have if we just relied on grants. So it's kind of a bet, but it also means that if you're for profit, your biggest problem is formulate the business model. And where, when you are in the younger days of a startup, um, what you're looking for is who are your early customers? And for us, it was a lot the, the public sector and NGOs in the beginning to which we could sell data and insights. And collaborating with those is, is painful in the beginning because you're just a small company. You're looking, you only have runway for a couple of months. And all the processes, the procurement processes take months, almost a year before you can get your first you know, checkout. Uh, and so you sort of need to live until that stage. So you need to unlock simple funding that allows you to survive to that stage. Uh, now we are at the latest stage where we actually have formulated a business model that is much clearer and also the, the general, um, general business models around this topic have changed because there's so much awareness out there that companies understand and that they need to change and they're setting pledges. So now everything has changed, but a couple of years ago it was very difficult in the beginning. Um, I would like to challenge you here a bit not in terms that I don't follow your logic, but I think that there are in principle other options. And I mean in principle because I also agree with you that now they are not. But the idea is like, I mean, like what we need, one of the key issues that you all mentioned is like access to data, right? And then we also know very much that data themselves, like the data collection are a big problem. So, but what about if they are like data stewards and data trusts where data are provided by users and the users, they pay a fee, possibly, for uh, data management, guaranteeing certain rights that are held by the users. And for example, such data trusts and stewards would, uh, they would possibly like have clauses say, for specific, for good purposes, for research purposes, these data are provided. 
for other purposes they are not. Um, and they would fulfill other uh, aims, like, I mean, if you just imagine that you don't have uh, like, like smartphones that suck all the data out of you, but you have really control who to give it to you, as a user, you can give it to the data trust, but not to others, and then you would be happy to pay a fee, because um, currently you have all the social services for monetary fee, but you add uh, in, in payment, you give all the data, and many people are not happy about this trade-off. Right? They would be happy to pay a little bit, a few euros a month or something, which could, does not need to be much in order to have like actually the data protected. So, like, I mean, like, I think this is kind of the scope of ideas. I mean, uh, Roger is working on that, for example, and there are a few others. And I think it's uh, very worthwhile to have a look at to these um, this, uh, efforts and to possibly work together with them um, because it would enable, for example, data platforms that have very useful academic data for, for academic research, high level of protection, um, uh, and um, also uh, benefits for the US, so uh, achieving diff several th things at a diff different time. And then um, you have one of the issues that you need a lot of money that you need for data, for example, you have solved or semi-solved by this. Okay, so we have already um, learned about some constraints that AI um, or machine learning applications um, put on the organizations. Um, so, um, Given that we have limited funding and limited access to expertise, especially in the public sector, how can we avoid that machine learning is actually a distraction from, from climate change mitigation or adaptation task? And even more so, um, machine learning can also have very negative impacts on the climate. So um, what are some of the characteristics of, of solutions that need to be paid attention to in this context? It's a, it's a very, very, very good question. I think it, it, uh, you, can, you can restrict it to machine learning, but you can also restrict it in general to any initiative that is out there. Uh, and the, the concept that I like to bring up is always the rebound effect, in the sense that if you build a technology that's more efficient at doing something, the real problem that you have is when you start using more of that technology in the end, such that you don't reduce emissions, but you increase them because you increased accessibility to that service. And you have exactly the same thing with machine learning. So I think you have to always watch out when you are building a system in general to quantify very precisely what is the impact you're having and to make sure that behind that you actually have regulation that is putting a proper price on carbon to not increase the thing to a bigger level. And very concretely speaking, uh, we are working on some initiatives to figure out what is the carbon footprint of um, using AI in general. When you are using so much electricity to uh, power all your GPUs in the cloud, that needs to be quantified and that will help you pick your battles at some point if you're uh, looking to reduce CO2 on, um, by building a model that impacts just a small piece. If your costs are bigger than your rewards, you might not want to do those things. So in a, in a perfect world, you know, you want to have a a ranking of all the different uh, things you can do, all the solutions, look at the amount of CO2 reduction potentials, you want to go from top to bottom. Uh, and that can only be done through, you know, sober quantification of different things you're doing. I liked one point that you mentioned, the um, actually runaway effects that are supported by AI in terms of emissions and demand. And it uh, relates to the talk that was given yesterday on privacy and Facebook, et cetera, which basically, I mean, but the bottom line is like 99% of application AI are done by Amazon, Google, and uh, Facebook in terms of psychological profiling that is effective in terms of uh, incentivizing additional consumption. So like, um, I would put that out that this is actually like a um, disbenefit that's produced in terms of like, um, greenhouse gas emissions. The question is, of course, like what's the utility, like individual utility, how it's aggregated with this additional consumption. There are like, um, different views on that, and it might be worthwhile to really look into that. Um, but then, then uh, ethical questions, psychological profiling, do, you, do we want that as users? More, many people don't want that. Um, we know that profiling might be useful also for uh, climate change policies or at least uh, subgroup targeting. And so that adds an uh, additional layer of ethical questions. And I think my, 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 th my, my, my uh, way of thinking is like, we may want to have some, but we need to have democratic public deliberation and decisions on that. So like uh, in terms of like, uh, Ulysses um, decided to actually listen to the sirens, right? To the incentives that are dangerous. And he bound himself to that. So like, and, and similarly, um, 
for example, uh, we can decide as societies that we want to have systematic incentives and subgroup targeting in terms of greenhouse gas emission reduction policies, but we want to have deliberation first that this is okay and perhaps others are not okay. And um, that would be one our direction to both possibly reduce runaway effects and enable positive things. And I think, again, deliberation is a very important dimension here. Um, so I think there's two kind of key issues which have different flavors. So the first is that there needs to be deep subject knowledge with any application, because otherwise you run the risk of simply reinventing the wheel by applying machine learning to different tasks. So it may be the case that a field is sophisticated, but isn't currently using machine learning, but the actual value added isn't really there. And you only know this unless you're really embedded in the field. The second issue is the idea that technology fixes everything and the frustration with the political and the policy process. And so trying to sidestep this with applying new technologies such as AI in this, I think is a kind of false solution because ultimately this will create new political deadlock and new distributional consequences that have to be dealt with as well. So these are kind of the two issues I see in this field. So, so very briefly, just wanting to relate to the cost of running the machine learning. It's true that nowadays, it's almost we are not even testing a linear regression. We are going directly to deep learning, which might want to train one million parameters, and it takes a week instead of one hundred parameters. And it's I, I don't really have an answer how to encourage people because PhD students they 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 try to do what's out there and what's required. Um, so I don't really have an answer, but we sh and, and also if you try a linear regression and you see it works, this might also gives you an understanding of the system. If you see you have a 95% accuracy using a linear model, this might also make you understand something about the system. So how we encourage that, I don't really have a solution, but yeah, I guess it would be good to do it somehow. If there are questions from the audience, maybe now is a good time to open it up to the audience. Um, so as a PhD student, can I sort of piggyback off on, on this last point of discussion? Because um, I'm, I don't really have a machine learning background, right? But when I go to a conference like this, uh, and I present the sort of very basic stuff that I do. The questions that I get from people here is, oh, you used LDAs and that more like 2000. Um, and if I actually want to get this published, I know that the chances of me getting it published are much higher if I would say use BERT, even though BERT might not be super useful to me at all. Um, just sort of having these, these buzzwords in there uh, would really uh, increase my chances of publication, even if it doesn't really increase the, the results that I'm getting. So I was wondering what your opinion is on how, how this discourse and, and, and the, the reach for the, the new shiny thing, so to speak, um, you think might be able to change. Yeah, I, I think that's difficult to do. Maybe one thing is to have both. Let's say you, you have both and you compare them and then you can, I don't know, maybe you managed to prove that LDA gives you a 93% accuracy and deep learning 94. And it's very difficult because now uh, we are going towards so much more complex system for to have a 3% increase in accuracy. And is this something that we want? Um, but yeah, I guess if you have both of them, that's probably a starting point. I would say that if you have from the start a very good accuracy with a linear model, I, I think that that should be enough if you manage to argument it well. If you start and you have 55% with a linear model, then it might be worthwhile trying to see, can I get a 70% with a deep learning or not? But it depends on what's the initial result. But my guess, we shouldn't lose sight of all those things that are simpler and yeah.
I just wanted to make a slightly more general point. Um, we're at a machine learning conference and all the algorithms, our search engines are, are chucking every news item about AI at us. And we obviously see the, the big tech companies are really going full throttle in this at the moment. But AI isn't what people are talking about in the corridors at Greenpeace and Amnesty International and in, and, in sort of politics. Um, it's, it's, it's a small part of a bigger problem. And I think it's really easy to uh, get blindsided by the fact that this is our industry and this is what we're doing and we're going to save the world through our algorithms. And I think just generally in the populace, um, you know, my dad has no idea what AI is. Um, it's not really um, as prominent as it feels like when we're sitting here. Um, I um, I see a, a big problem that, uh, with AI, basically that we have three companies, US companies right now, Google, Microsoft, and Amazon, who completely dominate the cloud space. I mean, we have to be on, on the cloud, for example. Um, and we, I, I posed a question already at the digital day, I think in, in, uh, in Basel uh, last year, why can't we as Europeans, let's say, not build our own cloud? Because we are, I mean, emissions are rising and these companies are not open. They don't say basically uh, how, if they are renewable or not. I mean, they, the marketing says they are, but apparently they are not at all. There's a lot of coal in it. Um, why isn't there an initiative to take that over and basically build cloud computing that's really 100% renewable, and we know it. So I can, I can answer to one part of the question, which is sort of the, the footprint of, of data centers, because this is something we've looked at. But I won't be able to answer on the part about why Europe is not you know, building their own cloud, I think, um, would be the wrong person to answer that. Um, but more and more, uh, you see cloud companies that are just uh, going away from the marketing claim, which is, you know, the 100% renewable because I'm just buying the right to claim myself renewable, the green certificates. Uh, now you actually have initiatives. I'm, I'm going to mention one which is publicly available report by Google you can look at. It's called the 24-7 initiative. They look at hour by hour how clean was the grid's electricity at that time and how much did they consume of electricity in order to match that up. And in general, with our, all, all of the conversations we're having with the industry, we're trying to push everyone to go away from marketing claims to go into more physical claims where they can say for sure they are 100% renewable because they install batteries and they have rooftop solar and they're using renewable energy from the grid. But this is definitely something we're not doing uh, enough. But it's a small part of your, uh, of your question, though. Don't know if anyone wants to... We need politicians here. <laughs> Hi, uh, this question goes back a bit to the uh, whole academics and publishing thing. Um, it seems like a lot of the focus on sharing results tends to be around uh, actual publications. And I feel like there's got to be other ways to share meaningful results uh, with community, um, you know, via social media and whatever, which seems to be quite effective these days. Um, does the academic community ever try to focus on these these other means as well, or is it not really a thing that people do? Um, like I, I would strongly defend uh, publications because they are peer reviewed, they're quality control, um, and uh, you can like I mean like company. I mean, of course, I'm, I'm I'm happy to go for for Twitter and and other um, public uh, communication service blogs, etc. And I think that can be done somehow more. But um, I think publication service quality control that's um, singular for academia. And I would say that uh, it should maintain this role. Yeah, um, I think this also depends on discipline. So from my field of political science, there's actually quite active engagement on Twitter and also to the extent that there's on the Washington Post, the monkey cage, which kind of started off as an academic blog, but now is a kind of institutionalized thing in a major newspaper that is actively about 
promoting and publicizing political science research to timely kind of topics where political scientists write op-eds on this. So for example, I've done this a couple of times, for example, in 2017, when there was these major spikes in air pollution in New Delhi, uh, me and a couple of co-authors kind of wrote up a piece about what the political science literature tells us about this. And also in terms of stuff, in terms of framing and climate communication, I've done this before, but it's really discipline by discipline. Um, and I think peer review is also very important in this. And I think that's also where you kind of get post publication peer review, at least in my field on the blogosphere, on Twitter, and in various newspapers that is also very valuable as well in terms of public communication. Um, uh, at least in the machine learning uh, community, uh, probably climate too, we are asking more and more to have the code and the data available. Um, so that's one thing, and it, yeah, it is a little bit unfortunate that you know not everyone has access to the publication. But I don't know. Probably on the website, you at least have the code and the data that you could use, um, and GitHub. So it's people who are more and more using that. You can see things there. Um, at the Swiss Data Science Center, we are de also developing a platform for data versioning. So that it's not just the code, but you have the data and the code, and these two allow you to see what is your process data. So there are more and more initiatives in this direction, not just publications. Yeah. yeah. Just, just maybe to connect to that. Um, there's also the, all the funding agencies, or many of the funding agencies, actually, they go now in this direction that you have to have a data management plan, that you have to uh, put your, your models open source and, uh, and are willing to share. So I think there are some additional initiatives so that you can also, um, it, because it's also a process of validation that you have, if you share your data, your code, um, people can challenge you if, if it's also is it, it's a good thing what you did. Yeah, now one 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 thing to add maybe on all of this. Yes, it's crucial to have a peer review, and it's crucial that you share as much as possible in terms of codes. You make the publication open and so on. But I think if you want to make it really accessible for people who are not experts in that domain, really look at interactive data visualizations. For me, that has been one of the most effective tools to uh, also get known out there. Uh, I've seen an incredible blog post made by someone at some point who uh, published a new uh, NLP model. And you can look at the paper, it's quite complicated, but the visualization enables you to type some text and see how it works, click around, understand the features, gives you another level of intuition into the model. But of course, you need this peer review validation level to make sure that this thing has been validated by the community. But really, data visualization is also a superb marketing tool to get your thing cited, not directly in the research world, but also on Twitter. It gives you another level of social validation on what you're doing and, and impact as well. Yeah, I just want to come back to the previous question related to uh, why is there any uh, European uh, cloud solution? Uh, I'm Pierre Soal from uh, the European Commission, so I, I want to comment on that in the sense that uh, you probably all know about the Copernicus uh, Sentinel satellites. So there are initiatives at the, at the level of Europe uh, to create uh, platforms that are called the DIAS, the Data Information and uh, Access uh, Services. And uh, these platforms, they provide access to the Copernicus satellite uh, Sentinel data. And you probably know that all these data are delivered in a free, full and open uh, data uh, licensing scheme. So, it, of course, they are very useful also for many uh, climate change applications. Now, there are also uh, ongoing uh, further initiatives by our colleagues from the DG Connect. And uh, they are uh, uh, working on the concept of Euro HPC, the European Open Science Cloud. And probably there, there will be soon also a new initiative, which is called the Mission Earth Initiative, that will provide actually the cloud computing resources for performing uh, simulations, accessing also Copernicus data. And this, uh, of course, can be very useful for climate change applications, including the use of uh, artificial intelligence in, uh, in this context. So th there are indeed initiatives. Of course, the, the big American companies, they are uh, at the forefront, so to say, but uh, work is ongoing at a European uh, level.
So AI, <clears throat> AI does not only contribute to climate change by training and electricity consumption, but also by fossil fuel companies using AI algorithms right now, for example, remote sensing algorithms to detect new oil resources. So it's pretty well known that although, for example, Microsoft, Google and Amazon have been pledging on being carbon neutral or even negative, they have contracts with those big oil companies and fossil fuel companies to support their efforts in gaining new resources. My question is, is that that as an AI research community, when we're developing, for example, algorithms such as high rest net that can improve resolutions of um, satellite imagery that could easily be misused by those fossil fuel companies. How, how, does, like, how should we as a climate change AI research community think about that? And maybe that also connects to uh, Felix points on data licensing in that sense, not only the licensing on who can use the data, but also licensing who can use that kind of model. Um, yeah. limited experience in this um, we do try and open source as much as we can um, and I think that's the right thing to do um, there was a particular project we worked on with um, Amnesty International called Troll Patrol um, and we've handed over the code and the data to them to act as gatekeepers um, so they will provide it on request and, and that is just another option um, open to, to if it's particularly sensitive data set and, and we've left it to them to be the arbiters of who and who who they will and won't share that with so it's a sort of open source but but with a with a barrier um just to anyone um but it's a difficult one um so i'm a firm believer in open science and ultimately the role of limiting usage is at the political level and the policy level right it needs to be regulation rather than researchers deciding to kind of withhold their research and their scientific progress for any fear of this i mean as a kind of disconnected but still linked example so if i do research on government repression and how this potentially prevents civil war within a country obviously autocratic countries could read this and then figure out what's the optimal way to deal with for like a potential uprising but if I just shut off research on this because of this reason, we really limit the field in terms of progress. So this is something that has to be solved at the pol political level rather than the personal level, I think. Yeah, I agree. But I think what you mentioned in terms of licensing could be still an idea. Like, I mean, you can publish codes and license it for, for example, specific purposes or uh, uh, non-commercial or even commercial under specific conditions and like of course the question of institutions and regulations very very hard on that but still I think we need to go into that direction and uh, look for um, I mean like your question directly I mean like of course there's a direct role to, to, to pressure the big companies to get out of that both by boycotting their infrastructure if that's possible I mean we have just heard how difficult that is uh, or boycotting not working for them and these kind of things I mean, like little steps to be taken, but uh, the important step, of course, is uh, creating a t uh, um, alternative infrastructures and regulations and incentives and uh, licensings. So perhaps one last question that um, one or two of you could answer. If I am a machine learning expert, researcher, student, and I want to get involved in the climate change field, and I want to work with you, what kind of collaborative process are you looking for? What kind of um, attitude towards the topic are you looking for? Major factor is of being interested, right? Like a motiv motivation is all. Like I am, I mean, there's, um, there's so many problems that uh, call for uh, collaboration or to work on it. And um, we like, I mean, it's science. So that and science means basically also as PIs or something. We don't know the answer. We don't know the answer neither in terms of what we come out nor what's the ideal method. So it's like basically like the open-minded approach just to get into it and try things out and have a lot of discussions, of course, because that enables much quicker feedback and learning on the method and what the outcomes are. Um, so I'm coming from machine learning, so it's not easy. So one thing is that I think in machine learning, we have access to fairly clean data sets. 
which makes things easier because we can go towards the methods easier. Uh, while if you want to work on a domain science, the data might not be so clean, it can be messy, it can take longer to understand what's in the data. So beyond motivation, which of course is needed, I think it's also a little bit more patience uh, to get past that step of understanding the data. Um, so a very general point is the best thing you can do is figure out your comparative advantage relatively quickly. So it's not about your level of technical skills, but it's about your level of technical skills compared to others that potentially vary in other aspects. So if you have great machine learning background, but you know some very specific country details, then really focus on this and push this because this is going to be your kind of unique aspect to contribute. Um, and I think also when, and I can relate to this myself, when you first learn new tools, it's kind of like, this is the tool I apply to everything. Um, be mindful of this, be open to listen as to why this may not be appropriate, why there's kind of other relative advantages in terms of different methods. And yeah, just willingness to listen is always a good thing to have. All right, we're fast approaching lunchtime. So let's thank our panelists again. That's <laughs>